Hello, everyone. So good to see you. And welcome to the second installment of this uh, month's new series of coffee and conversation about the Constitution. I am Jeff Rosen. I am the new president and CEO of this wonderful center. We are uh, the only institution in the country chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. And to achieve that goal, we have three uh, aims. We are the Museum of We the People, the Center for Civic Education, and America's Town Hall, the place where people can come and hear the best arguments on all sides of constitutional questions and make up their own minds. In that spirit, I am so thrilled today to introduce you to our author, Gerard Magliotta. Um, he has written the definitive biography of the James Madison of the 14th Amendment. And in the course of our, in the course of our conversation, you will come to appreciate how centrally important John Bingham, the man who drafted the 14th Amendment, which is the central amendment that protects American uh, liberties and applies the Bill of Rights against the states. This man had no definitive biography of him written before, and Gerard has just, it's a riveting job. I, I don't, I mean, I, I may get riveted by constitutional uh, law more than uh, uh, some people, but you too will be riveted by this book, and the discussion we're gonna have is gonna illuminate so much the issues that Americans are debating today and help us understand the origins of our liberties. So I'm gonna briefly introduce our author and then we're just gonna begin the conversation. Um, uh, uh, professor Maglioka is the Samuel Rosen professor at Indiana University, no relation. I, I, I think I don't uh, have any relatives out there, but it's an honorable name and I'm glad you, your professorship bears it. Uh, and, and that's at the uh, uh, Indiana University Robert H. McKinney School of Law. You've written three books, over 20 articles on constitutional law and intellectual property. You're an, he's an active blogger on concurring opinions and balkanization. I love his posts and follow them avidly. Before joining Indiana University, he spent two years as a lawyer at Covington and Burling, one year as a law clerk for Judge Guido Calabresi on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. Judge Calabresi was our dear teacher as well, and we shared a teacher in Akil Amar at Yale Law School, and I think Akil had something to do with your reasons for writing this book in the first place. So why don't you tell me why you chose to write about John Bingham? Well, I encountered John Bingham in law school. Uh, there's always a brief mention that he is the author of the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution that guarantees equality for all Americans. And then I had professors, most notably Akil, who emphasized Bingham's role in writing this language and in really changing the Constitution fundamentally from what it had been in 1787. And so I was interested in looking for a biography of this man and I didn't find much. And what I did find was disappointing so I thought to myself, isn't that a shame that someone who did so much hasn't had a biographical treatment? Somebody should do it. And about 10 years later, I decided that I should be the one to do it. And that's where this book comes from. Spectacular. And you uh, call Bingham, you say Lincoln was our greatest constitutional poet, but Bingham was the man who turned that poetry into prose. What do you mean by that? Well, People are familiar with the Gettysburg Address and see that as a representation of the change in the Constitution from one that was focused on a more state-centered view of national life and one that was a pro-slavery Constitution in some respects. And that change, of course, occurred to a different Constitution during the period of the Civil War and Reconstruction. However, the story usually stops with Lincoln's death. You saw the movie recently, right? And basically the war ends, Lincoln is killed, and that's it. But in fact, that was only just the beginning for the constitutional debate about what the Civil War meant. And it was up to people like Bingham, and not just Bingham, of course, there were others who were, who were important and who are discussed in the book, who really had to take those words and translate them into law. And that's where we get the 14th Amendment. And to some extent, it's a, it's a you could say it's the work of lawyers, um, but it's work that was necessary and has had tremendous impact ever since. Well, we're going to talk a lot about the 14th Amendment and how it came to be and Bingham's role in it, but why don't I just begin? I like to take out my National Constitutional Center pocket constitution at all times, and I hope you will get one, ladies and gentlemen, when you leave. Uh, let's just read the 14th Amendment, and then I'll ask you what 
uh, Bingham was trying to achieve when he wrote it. Uh, we're going to read section one, which was the part I gather that Bingham contributed the most to, although did, did he in fact write all of it or just, just section one? He wrote the second sentence of section one, which is the one that we use the most in most of the famous cases you're familiar with from the Supreme Court. Great. So I'll, it's the second sentence that I'll read. Pay close attention to me, ladies and gentlemen. This is important. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Now, there's a lot, as we know, to unpack with each clause of that remarkable sentence. But why don't you tell our audience, in essence, why does that make Lincoln, uh, Bingham the most uh, important constitutional uh, philosopher uh, since Lincoln? What, did, what, did that, what was he trying to achieve with that? Well, there are several things that he was trying to achieve. The first was to guarantee fundamental rights to all Americans, black and white. He liked to say in the years leading up to the Civil War when he was a member of Congress that the word white is not in the Constitution. And now, what were those fundamental rights that he wanted to guarantee other than obviously the abolition of slavery? Uh, well, Bingham's view, and he was far ahead of his time in this respect, was that the entire Bill of Rights should apply to all Americans against the actions of the federal government and state governments. Now, at the time, the Bill of Rights, of course, did not apply to all Americans and also did not apply to the actions of state governments. So, for example, the state of Virginia could censor speech, and that was perfectly okay. Uh, so, his position on that is one that took a long time to actually be adopted by the Supreme Court, and we think of it as sort of obvious today to say that the Bill of Rights should apply to states as well as the federal government. Uh, but he's the one who really contributed that idea in a most sort of significant way. Now, then also, he wanted to guarantee equal treatment under the law for all people. Now, it's a little less clear exactly what he meant by that, though, again, of course, slavery and sort of ending it was a big part of that uh, story. But clearly, he felt that the government should be taking steps to ensure that there was equal enforcement of the law, especially in the South, but elsewhere as well, uh, with respect to fundamental rights and civil liberties. Beautifully said. And uh, as you put it, many of the most important controversies involving civil liberties and civil rights today are litigated not under the original Bill of Rights, but under the Equal Protection Clause and Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment, because they involve state abridgments of rights like free speech and uh, the rest. Um, Bingham, though, believed that states had no power to infringe basic human rights, including the rights of African Americans, even before the 14th Amendment was passed. And he had a theory uh, that you call the ellipsis theory, that the original uh, Constitution actually prevented the states from abridging basic rights. Tell, tell us about that theory and why it was necessary to pass the 14th Amendment, uh, despite the fact that Bingham thought the states were already states of things. Well, Bingham and other abolitionists argued that the original Constitution protected these fundamental rights for all Americans. Now, in order to make that argument, though, they had to basically reread a portion of the constitutional text that guaranteed the privileges and immunities of citizens uh, to say that it included national privileges and immunities uh, rather than the way most people understood it at the time, which was that basically one state couldn't discriminate against someone coming in from another state. Uh, now, to do this, he, he sort of said, oh, well, there were some words that are clearly supposed to be in there to make it make sense that would protect fundamental rights. They're just not there. But uh, at one point he said, uh, it's common sense to say that those words should be read into this provision. Now, of course, that was putting it a little strongly, and there were many people who did not find that to be common sense at all. So part of the reason for having the 14th Amendment was to sort of rectify this by clearly stating that there were national privileges and immunities and that they were covered 
by the Constitution uh, in a broad way. So that was one of the reasons for writing the 14th Amendment in the language that he did. Wonderful. Um, he also, I learned from this book, was one of the main people who coined the phrase the Bill of Rights. Starting next year, I'm thrilled to share with you, we here at the National Constitution Center will display one of the 12 original copies of the Bill of Rights. Mm. It's almost certainly Pennsylvania's copy. It's been in uh, New York for uh, 100 years, and New York has generously agreed to share it with us, and we're going to build a magnificent new gallery of freedom to display it. But that um, phrase, the Bill of Rights, was not really in current use until the 20th century, and yet I, I learned from you that Bingham used it in 1866 when he produced a pamphlet called One Country, One Constitution, and One People, a speech of John Bingham in support of proposed amendments to enforce the Bill of Rights. Did he actually coin, coin the phrase? Well, he didn't coin the phrase, but it was certainly not a common phrase in the way that we understand it. The Supreme Court never referred to the first set of amendments as the Bill of Rights until sometime in the 1890s. Um, now, again, sometimes if you're very far ahead of your time right. and then you do things that become commonplace later, it's easy to sort of think, oh, really, what was this contribution that this person was making? Of course everybody knows that the first set of amendments is the Bill of Rights and that it's important. But these are things that he contributed and sort of persuaded everyone so thoroughly that now it's kind of like, well, what have you done for us lately? Um, and so he was one of the few who really emphasized that in Congress after the Civil War ended. In speech after speech, he talked about the fact that the Bill of Rights was a central part of the Constitution, that it should apply to all Americans. Uh, now, he wasn't perhaps as successful in persuading his colleagues as might have been the case that this was true, and this is one of the reasons why it took a long time for the Supreme Court to sort of accept the position that he was talking about. Um, but he was, was probably the most prominent person of the day who was using that phrase a lot. But you helped show so dramatically that the intentions, the original intentions of the framer, of the main framer, the guy who drafted the 14th Amendment, were that the state should have to obey the Bill of Rights. And yet, as you say, it took almost 100 years for the Supreme Court to come around to that position. How was it possible that soon after the 14th Amendment was adopted, the Supreme Court, as you discuss in a case called the Slaughterhouse Cases, essentially ignored Bingham's view and refused to apply the Bill of Rights to the states. And why did it take you know, nearly 100 years for Bingham's decision to finally be vindicated? Well, there's a funny story about that in that there was a train trip that Bingham took uh, while he was still in Congress with the Supreme Court justice who ended up writing the slaughterhouse cases. And there's a story about the fact that Bingham was apparently talking to him every day about, here's what the 14th Amendment is supposed to mean. Evidently, that may not have worked out so well. One, one might wonder if the, the lobbying sort of uh, was irritating rather than, than convincing. But um, I think, more seriously, it's, it's the Supreme Court often does not go with what we might consider the correct interpretation of a particular provision. They have their own way of doing things, and uh, that is part of the reason. Now, the other thing to say is that support for the kinds of things that Bingham was interested in, equality and fundamental rights, declined substantially in the years following the Civil War. That is, once you got out about 10 years after the end of the war, um, there was just uh, much less public sentiment for doing these things because it was hard and because people wanted to move on to other subjects. And that, in some sense, had an impact on the way the Supreme Court viewed these questions. Uh, and indeed, it wasn't really until the 1960s that you saw, sort of with a second reconstruction led by Martin Luther King, kind of the vindication of a lot of the things that Bingham was trying to do. There are uh, some uh, judges who say that they believe in the original understanding of the Constitution, such as most prominently Robert Bork, had said that the Supreme Court was correct not to apply the Bill of Rights against the states because the 14th Amendment wasn't supposed to do that. You show pretty clearly that that view is wrong, and actually Bingham intended quite the opposite. Yes. I mean, the, the only thing that one could say is if you just want to say, well, Bingham was sort of this idiosyncratic person, and so we shouldn't really pay attention to what he had to say. Now, note that nobody would say that about James Madison. Nobody would say, well, he was just one person, so really, why should we care what he had to say about this or that? Um, so. There's no doubt as to what Bingham's views were about many of these subjects with respect to the 14th Amendment. So 
unless you want to say that he was sort of someone ought, who ought not to be paid attention to or that his uh, legal skills were somehow inadequate, which is something that people who didn't like the substance of what he wanted to do to happen would say, uh, you, you cannot reach the conclusion uh, of the, like the one you described uh, by a fair reading of the evidence. As, as you describe, he was maligned for much of history. So he was dismissed as, uh, as uh, fuzzy-headed or as insignificant. But you paint quite a different picture. I want you to tell us about what kind of person he was, to br bring him to life. You quote this uh, contemporary account of him published in his prime, 1863. In person, he's spare and rather slight, sharp in face and sharp all over, as well in mind as in body, rather inclined to verbosity. He is nevertheless regarded on all hands to be one of the ablest debaters in the House. Paint a little bit more of a picture for our, uh, for our guest about what, what sort of person he was. He was a passionate person and a serious person. He was not, as far as I can tell, someone with a really great sense of humor. He was a serious person who wanted to do serious things. He was someone who believed strongly in the equality of African Americans. One of his best friends was his college classmate who was African American, and they corresponded for years. <coughs> and that was a very unusual thing in the middle of the 19th century. He was an extremely eloquent man. Basically, when the Republicans in Congress needed somebody to get up and make their case, they asked him. Uh, now, verbosity was sort of more the style in those days, and that can be a little frustrating when uh, we read the speeches now. Um, but he was uh, someone who, I think, was a relentless champion of his views, the type of person where if you were in a meeting he was someone you would respectfully listen to because you maybe <coughs> didn't like the person so much or thought they were really friendly, but you knew that they had thought about it deeply and felt very strongly about it, and so their views deserved respect. Now, having said that, he was also a, a wonderful family man. He was married and had, uh, well, three children who lived to be a, uh, to adulthood. Uh, he, he lost many. You talk about the tragedy of he, the, the many yes. children he I mean, he, he lost many children to illness. In fact, two who died during the Civil War of typhus when he came through the town uh, that he lived in. And uh, he was also kind of a, a, a pretty popular raconteur who would come, somebody that people liked to invite to dinner, basically, because he liked quoting Shakespeare and was apparently uh, very convivial. Uh, and, um, and all of that, I think, kind of paints a picture of someone who was more a politician than a sort of abstract thinker. He wasn't a philosopher so much the way maybe Jefferson was. But he liked the rough and tumble of politics. He liked mixing it up on the House floor. And one of the things I think my favorite aspects of the book are sort of reprinting some of his back and forth dialogues with other members of Congress, some of them from the South, and some of them that got pretty nasty. But he certainly gave as well as, uh, as he got. I, I was struck by how at what a high level the constitutional debates in Congress were and how precise the debaters were. It was really something to read those. Uh, just a little more in his personal life, he had an uh, interesting uh, friendship with uh, General Custer. Is that right? That is true. Uh, Custer, who I understand, by the way, that after Lincoln, he's the second most popular subject of biographies in the United States, uh, which I didn't know <laughs> until recently. <laughs> but um, That should be your next one. Yeah, it could be. Uh, Custer was uh, from uh, a town near, near to Bingham's town, and uh, Bingham is the person who got him into West Point, and also the person who was his patron bailed him out of trouble a couple of times and constantly kept promoting him during the Civil War, telling uh, the Secretary of War, Edmund Stanton, oh, you really ought to look at this Custer guy. He, he'd, he'd make a great uh, general. Um, we know that after the Little Bighorn, he, he did write a letter to Custer's father saying how sorry he was to have heard about this, but um, that's about all we know uh, about what he, what he thought about the end of Custer's career, which obviously didn't work out so well. And that was despite the fact that Custer had an affair with one of Bingham's friend's uh, daughters or something like that, and it was, it was a juicy story. That's what yeah, I the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, so, so Custer kept going to Bingham saying, I want to get a reference letter to West Point. It works the same way uh, works the same way then as it does now. And Bingham said, well, I've already promised a couple of people I can't do it for you. And uh, then Custer had an affair with the daughter of a kind of prominent Republican in town, 
And this Republican uh, kind of unusually went to his congressman and said, hey, write this guy a letter to West Point and get him out of here because I don't want him to see my daughter. Uh, and so Bingham did. And of course, the Secretary of War at the time was Jefferson Davis, actually. So there's this letter from Bingham to Jefferson Davis saying you know, uh, that he recommends Custer. And um, strangely enough, Bingham still was very fond of Custer, even though he had had this affair. So that, 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 that there was some, some chemistry there that we, don't, that we don't know about. He was not a prude, it seems. Right. Okay. Definitely not. He, drank, he liked his wine, so I think it's fair to say he was, he was not a prude. Um, he was, however, uh, all over not only uh, as if writing the 14th Amendment wasn't enough, he was involved with the major constitutional events of his time, including the, uh, the trial of the uh, <coughs> conspirators of John Wilkes Booth, who uh, assassinated Abraham Lincoln. And you tell the riveting story of how Bingham was criticized for his aggressive prosecution of M Mary Surratt, among others, the owner of the boarding house. And in the course of this prosecution, he advanced extremely expansive views about the president's authority in wartime that are relevant to our current debates, including the view that the due process clause of the Constitution doesn't apply in wartime at all, uh, and, and therefore the conspirators could be uh, tr tried in military tribunals. Tell us more about that incredible chapter and, 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 and Bingham's very expansive views about the executive power in wartime. Right. So as a member of Congress during the Civil War, Bingham said in his speech that the due process clause is a clause for peacetime. And in wartime, you got, or were entitled to, only whatever due process the government felt like giving to you. And he supported, indeed, he played a role in drafting the legislation that suspended habeas corpus uh, and said that the president could detain people without charges uh, indefinitely. Now, when the assassins killed, uh, when, Bo when Booth killed the president, uh, his co-conspirators were arrested and were tried by a military court, not by a civil court. And Bingham was one of the prosecutors, gave the closing argument in the trial, and defended the constitutionality of this against charges that basically these people were citizens, the war was over, so they were entitled to a jury trial. And Bingham had a variety of arguments that he made against that, um, which to some extent have a resemblance to the arguments that are made now with respect to the Guantanamo detainees, at least the ones who were citizens, in that Bingham argued that, look, it's still really wartime. The war just ended. Uh, it would be wrong to give these people a jury trial when they have committed an act of war, killing the commander in chief. And also that really, why should they get more process than a soldier in the Union Army who was accused of a crime and would only get a military trial. Uh, so even though there were a lot of uh, people, including Lincoln's Attorney General, who did not think that this was a constitutional process to try the conspirators at a military court, uh, Bingham was never uh, sort of apologetic about it. He, he thought basically they got a fair trial. And of course, they were all convicted. Uh, and, um, and some of them were, were, were executed. But he, he thought that it was a perfectly fair proceeding and that he had done his duty by participating. I, I was so surprised to read about that incident. I mean, how do you reconcile that extremely expansive view of executive power with his great devotion to civil liberties and peacetime? Well, one, one answer is a distinction between war and peace, and that the Civil War in particular was one where you might think that all necessary steps had to be taken to win the war. And that in that sense, it's, a, it's even different from what we might consider other wars in American history and, and their impact on, on civil liberties. Another thing one could say, and I don't, I don't have any evidence for this, but I, I did wonder as to whether eventually his experience with that trial, especially as it became, came to be criticized more heavily afterwards, influenced his thinking in the opposite direction to think that, yes, we really ought to be providing these sorts of guarantees, that maybe that was an unfortunate emergency exception and that it was kind of an example of what we shouldn't be doing in the future. I don't have any direct evidence for that, but there, there is some causal connection you might draw there. How interesting. So in that case, if you were writing, uh, if you were a law clerk for Justice Scalia and trying to tell him what John Bingham would think about the Guantanamo uh, tribunals, um, wh wh what would you say? Well, I, I think the answer is he, he'd be for it, um, 
because it, it's, he made the statements very clearly uh, as a member of Congress and during the trial, and there, there's, there's not much doubt. Now, of course, the Supreme Court did, hasn't really followed what Bingham said in this respect either, uh, though you might feel differently about that as compared to some of the other things that Bingham had to say. Uh, but no, there was no doubt as to where he stood, and I think to some extent that may be something that will eventually get taken into account in subsequent due process cases in the wartime. Completely fascinating. Uh, other great conflicts that he was involved in include the impeachment of President Andrew Johnson, and that was so intricately tied up with the controversy over the ratification of the 14th Amendment and Johnson's uh, reluctance to enforce it that, that I need to ask you about the different stages of uh, this. First of all, tell us about the controversy over ratification. Obviously, the, if the southern states uh, were uh, admitted to the Union uh, before they ratified, then the amendment wouldn't have been ratified because you wouldn't have gotten the, the, the necessary supermajority of states. What was Bingham's plan for the conditions under which the southern states should be readmitted to the Union? Right. So the great debate that comes after the war is what do we ask of the southern states to make them sort of full partners again in the United States. And Bingham's view was that there ought to be a 14th Amendment that guaranteed fundamental rights, that the real problem was that the law was inadequate and needed to be fixed, and that if the Southern states then ratified the 14th Amendment, then they could come back in and be states again. Now, in this respect, his opponent was Thaddeus Stevens, who believed that we should be demanding a lot more of the South including uh, taking property away from the former slave owners and redistributing it to the freed slaves, disenfranchising various people who had been involved with the Confederacy, and so on. And they waged this great debate that lasted for about a year as to which view would prevail. And Bingham ultimately won that debate, although he did make a few concessions to Stevens' position. And basically his argument against what Stevens wanted to do uh, was that it was just politically impossible and that you would never get the South to sort of do for the freed slaves what we wanted them to do if you uh, took such a heavy-handed approach. Now, of course, that was a very kind of controversial argument and one which sort of didn't quite play out historically the way maybe Bingham had hoped. Um, but as against that, you had Andrew Johnson, who was Lincoln's successor as president, who was against the 14th Amendment entirely and did everything he could to try to block uh, its ratification. So that sort of set up the, or was the predicate for the impeachment of the president by Congress. Tell us more about that impeachment. Congress passed this Tenure of Office Act. Why did, why did it pass it, and, and how is that related to Johnson's efforts to force the 14th Amendment? <coughs> Right, so um, the difficulty was that the South was occupied by the Union Army, and Congress wanted the South to do certain things to ratify the 14th Amendment, to have elections, to set up governments, to give the freed slaves a right to vote in these elections, but the president was commander-in-chief, so he could tell the commanding officers in these places, uh, don't do what Congress wants, wants you to do. So how did they try to solve that problem? Well. One answer was that the Secretary of War at the time, who was like the Secretary of Defense now, was a man named Edwin Stanton, who was Bingham's longtime friend. They worked together in the same little town in Ohio, and was a supporter of what Congress wanted to do. And as long as he was there, it was hard for the President to get any contrary orders obeyed, because the Secretary of War could say, oh, don't pay attention to what the President's saying, do what I want and what Congress wants. So, okay, well then what if the President fired the Secretary of War? So Congress passed a law saying, basically, you can't fire any cabinet member, by which they really just meant him, unless the Senate approves, which they weren't going to. Uh, now, this is a law that I think today we would think <coughs> would be unconstitutional, probably, um, based on subsequent things that the Supreme Court has said and precedent before Reconstruction. But at the time, Congress had the power to sort of insist upon this. Johnson eventually did fire Stanton because it was the only way he could sort of get his perspective on the 14th Amendment out there and enforced. And that's why Congress then impeached him. More, more accurately, it might, it might be to say they had an excuse to impeach him finally, and so they did. So this was not a trivial dispute over a legalistic uh, matter. This is the center 
of the clash between the president who doesn't want to enforce the 14th Amendment and, and Bingham and Congress who do. Um, Bingham was also afraid that the Supreme Court, as you said, might uh, thwart the 14th Amendment by striking down the Tenure and Office Act. And he had a rather radical proposal that the Supreme Court should be wiped out if it refused to uh, support Reconstruction. Tell us about his, his views on courts. Right. Well, it's fair to say that most of the uh, Reconstruction framers, if you will, were worried about what the Supreme Court would do. And their solution to the problem was to just prevent the Supreme Court from saying anything about the constitutionality of what they were doing. And this uh, sort of came in the form of a variety of threats. For example, a law saying that you needed a supermajority of t Supreme Court justices, two-thirds, to declare a law unconstitutional. <coughs> that was something Bingham talked about. He also talked about the fact of just wiping them out. Now, he never really made clear what that, what that meant, but... Um, but the, the <laughs> message... That's probably a good thing. Right. The message was clear, and of course, also there was the thought, though it wasn't stated openly, that, well, if, if they've impeached the president, they could also start impeaching Supreme Court justices. So eventually the Supreme Court sort of found a graceful way to uh, bow out and not decide any of the cases that were brought before them, uh, challenging the various acts of Congress as unconstitutional. But Bingham was certainly... You know, some people say Bingham was a moderate. Right, at least as compared to Thaddeus Stevens. And in some respects, this was true. But people who call for abolishing the Supreme Court aren't really what you, I think you and I would call moderates, <laughs> right? It's just, it's either a relative term or it's just showing that people just had different perspectives on how to solve the problems that came after the Civil War. He certainly was not a fan of the Supreme Court. You describe his fierce criticisms of the Dred Scott decision and his uh, attempts to strip the court of jurisdiction to review some of the uh, decisions challenging uh, Lincoln. So would he have thought that Congress or the Supreme Court should take the lead in enforcing the, the rights of the 14th Amendment? Well, he believed that Congress should take the lead. Now, of course, he was a congressman, right? So one might understand that. But his initial proposal for the 14th Amendment, for the section that we now have, simply said that Congress shall have the power to enforce fundamental rights and equality and didn't really say anything about the courts. Now, then that was modified because people thought maybe that would give Congress too much power or it didn't give the courts a role and he kind of modified it into the language that we, that we see now. Um, but he was also very active in the years following the ratification of the 14th Amendment in putting together legislation that would enforce the 14th Amendment against the Ku Klux Klan or other folks in the South who were trying to resist uh, the will of the people. Uh, now, given what the Supreme Court did to the 14th Amendment after he left Congress, perhaps his suspicions about the court were justified. And, but on the other hand, you could say his faith in Congress wasn't ultimately justified either because Congress, at a certain point, stopped sort of the vigorous enforcement of the 14th Amendment's guarantees. There is a vigorous debate today, obviously, about whether the Supreme Court is correct to strike down landmark acts of Congress designed to guarantee equality under the 14th Amendment, including the Voting Rights uh, Act, which also implicates the, the 15th Amendment, and uh, uh, other laws. What would Bingham have thought about that? Well, I think that Bingham would have taken a very strong position that Congress should be given great deference with respect to its enforcement of the 14th and the 15th Amendments. I mean, he, he didn't write the 15th Amendment, but he played a role in, uh, in the construction of it. And I think that also uh, he would have been surprised to learn that an important principle of the Reconstruction Amendments is that the states are all equal. Um, because certainly the states were not treated equally in the period immediately following the Civil War. The South was treated differently uh, than the North when it came to uh, ratification of these amendments. After all, they were occupied and kind of, in effect, given a strong reason to ratify the 14th Amendment uh, under the threat that they would stay occupied until they said yes. Uh, now, Bingham was certainly not against states or against states' rights, but I think in the context of racial equality, he had a, a strong nationalist perspective. He had some extremely powerful things to say about race, and he believed that the essence of the 14th Amendment, as you put it, was to eliminate any hint of caste-affirming legislation. Tell us, well, I guess, did, did he believe that the 14th Amendment was centrally about protecting African Americans? 
Yes, although he, his vision went quite beyond that in the sense that the fundamental rights that he was talking about would apply to all citizens, white or black, in the states or with respect to the national government. Now, when it came to equality, I think what he was principally thinking about was African-American equality uh, because that was the sort of the, the key problem that they were dealing with at the time. Um, so that, that was the central purpose. Um, of course, he didn't preclude the, the idea that it could be expanded further. For example, he supported the idea of unwritten constitutional rights. He said that he believed that they existed, though he didn't know what all of them were. And uh, certainly, he didn't really make statements that were hostile to the notion that other groups besides African Americans or groups be or categories beyond race could be included in the guarantee of equal protection. Although he did not believe that the uh, 14th Amendment uh, uh, protected uh, uh, women uh, fully when it came to uh, political rights, because he didn't think that the 14th <laughs> Amendment covered political rights. And when a delegation of uh, women's equality advocates came to him, he, he, he rebuffed their claims. Tell us about that. Well, yes. Yeah, so the question is, what about women? And his position was that basically there was no constitutional right for women to vote. That if states wanted to let women vote, that was fine, but there wasn't a guarantee of that. So he was giving a speech about equality <coughs> one day, and Susan B. Anthony was in the audience, and she you know, raised her hand. Mr. Bingham, what about women? And his answer was uh, that I am not the puppet of logic. I am the slave of practical politics. <laughs> now, if you think about that for a second, that's an interesting political answer. Because what is he saying there? Is he saying, gee, I would like to help you, but I can't get enough people to go along and, and help you out? Or was that just his way of dodging the question? Uh, hard to say. He didn't say much about uh, women's rights in any of the materials that I could find. So it's really not clear what position he had. I think the answer is he probably didn't have a position that was that much different than other people in Congress at that point in time. But his view, quite clearly uh, shared by many in Congress, that the 14th Amendment only protected civil rights and not political or social rights, suggests that he understood the 14th Amendment's equality guarantees to be less sweeping than their interpreted today. In other words, not to prevent the government from discriminating uh, against or in favor of people unless a civil right was involved. What does that say about what he would have thought about affirmative action? Yeah, that's difficult to say. Now, of course, some of his views were, were broader than what could be passed. So one has to distinguish between what he would have thought about it as opposed to what the 14th Amendment ended up protecting or saying. Um, for example, I while he never took a, a, a direct position on segregation, everything that, you know, if you look at the whole arc of his life, it's hard to believe he would have thought that that was constitutional or would have supported it. Now, with respect to affirmative action, I don't know. One way of thinking about it is that he was kind of someone who believed in formal equality under the law. And affirmative action, in that sense, w is, is troubling because it is not providing formal equality. It's providing something more like functional equality or equality of opportunity. Now, he did vote for things in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War that gave benefits only to the freed slaves, uh, though one could say that, well, that was in a limited temporary emergency sort of setting. He never really explained why he voted for these things, so it's kind of hard to answer the question. So the, the historian in me says, I, I can't really answer that question uh, definitively. You, you kind of have to read the book probably and draw your own conclusion. Very responsible, but the journalist in me wants for you to keep channeling Bingham on contemporary topics. But I won't, uh, but, but that raises a difficulty because as you say, we have to care not only what Bingham thought, but also what the conventions that ratified the 14th Amendment thought, not just the framer, but the ratifiers mentioned. And this is complicated because these conventions are forced to ratify the amendment at gunpoint. They're basically told you can't come back into the Union unless you ratify. Was that arrangement, which Bingham himself supported, illegal? And in that sense, does that complicate the status of the 14th Amendment as, as uh, supreme law? Well, I don't think so, uh, though it's certainly problematic. However, <coughs> if you look at other examples of constitutional change in our history, you will find that there are lots of questionable legalities or illegalities involved. So if you look too closely, you might be disturbed at, uh, at what you find. Um, 
Bingham's original thought was simply to say that, well, why don't we say that if three-fourths of the northern states ratify the 14th Amendment, then it's part of the Constitution. We don't need the South at all. But he couldn't get enough people to go along with that. So then he, he went to this sort of plan B, if you will, <laughs> which was that uh, the South ought to be given an opportunity to vote <coughs> yes or no on whether to ratify. Now, of course, it wasn't a normal election. But then again, as Bingham explained, well, it, these are not normal times. You know, the civil government in the South had collapsed, and only the army could provide some framework for making decisions. So really, what else could you do unless you simply said that, well, the South could just come back in the way they were before the war, and that would mean that the war was kind of in vain because all these people would have died and what would have been accomplished. So are there legal questions there that are interesting when I teach a class about the subject like I'm doing now? Sure. Does that undermine the legitimacy of something that a clear, overwhelming majority of Americans on the victorious side of the Civil War believed in? No, I don't think so. So the resistance of southern states to ratify brings us back to the impeachment story, which we didn't finish, because now you have to tell us after Andrew Johnson uh, fires Stanton, despite the Tenure and Office Act, Bingham is one of the House managers for the impeachment, and he takes a very strong position that the president cannot refuse to follow an act of Congress once the Supreme Court has uh, not said it's unconstitutional. W w tell us more about that position and his performance in the impeachment trial. Well, now an impeachment trial, if you remember from President Clinton's impeachment trial, some members of the House go over and act as the prosecutors and the Senate acts as the jury. So Bingham gave the closing argument in the impeachment trial, took three days, and uh, was kind of a very big event. And he made a number of claims there that are a little hard to square with some other things that he said. I mean, prosecutors sometimes who are advocating for something will s overstate things or put things strongly to try to win their case in a way that maybe doesn't quite work out otherwise. Um, so for example, he said that, um, well, the president had no right to refuse to obey an act of Congress even if he thought it was unconstitutional and wanted to test it in the courts. And when people pointed out, well, what if Congress passed some really awful, clearly illegal thing, Bingham's answer was, well, I mean, that's why we have elections. And the problem with that is, of course, there weren't elections going on, for example, in the South at that point. They weren't allowed to be in Congress until they ratified the 14th Amendment. And it wasn't really great to say, well, the courts could come in and do something because the Supreme Court was being threatened with all sorts of terrible things if they were to try to interfere with what Congress was doing. Now, it, it is fair to say that uh, Bingham's position on that probably has some merit with respect to presidential refusals to enforce the law just because they think a law is unconstitutional. That, we might say, is going too far uh, at least, uh, you know, except for some extraordinary circumstances. Um, but Bingham was doing his best to try to persuade the sort of uh, wavering senators to vote to convict Andrew Johnson and remove him so that the 14th Amendment could be ratified. I mean, it's an incredible image. You have the author of the 14th Amendment then leading the impeachment charge against the president who's trying to thwart him, and yet Bingham's arguments were rejected in the sense that the Senate refused to convict. What, what, what does that say constitutionally about the, standard, about the standards for impeachment? Did the Senate reject his view that the President uh, can't refuse to carry out the constitutional law? Well, Johnson was acquitted by one vote. That is, they fell one vote short of two-thirds to convict. Now, why did they fall short? Part of it is because Johnson met with some senators and basically assured them that, okay, if you vote not guilty, I will stop interfering with the 14th Amendment. And also, by the way, I'll give you some nice sugar plums in terms of jobs for your friends and things like that. And uh, that was, uh, ironically, one of the senators that is uh, discussed in John F. Kennedy's Profiles in Courage. He's a Republican who voted not guilty and while he stood up to his party and so on. He's one of the guys that got all the nice jobs for his friends. <laughs> so he wasn't really such a profile in courage. But anyway, um, the, uh, so, the, the effort at impeachment and conviction failed, but the 14th Amendment was, was ratified. So if you think that that was the goal, then it isn't so clear that Bingham's arguments 
were rejected. And you might say also that we were better off without a precedent where a president was actually removed simply because he was opposing the policies of Congress. So in that sense, while it was messy, you might think that the end result worked out reasonably well. You know, we had the other night here a wonderful constitutional conversation with my friend uh, Chris Segal, and uh, it was a conservative group, and many people said President Obama should be impeached because he is refusing to carry out parts of the health care law. He's being selective about delaying the uh, employer mandate, and that's, he should be impeached for that. What would Bingham say to that claim? Well, the one thing we, c well, the one thing we can say is Bingham was a strong proponent of congressional power as a member of Congress for his whole career. So certainly in any dispute between Congress and the President, he tended to take the side of Congress. Now, uh, although, I mean, he loved Lincoln and thought he was a wonderful president, so that really didn't begin until, well, it didn't apply to Republican presidents, uh, <laughs> basically. <laughs> but um, so I think Bingham was reluctant to vote for impeachment. You know, he only did it, Thaddeus Stevens was saying that, that Johnson should be impeached months before Bingham agreed to that. Ultimately, Bingham felt like they needed some reason to impeach, a good reason, and they thought he thought the Tenure of Office Act violation was the reason that could convince enough senators to vote for conviction. So I think that <coughs> with something like uh, impeaching President Obama, maybe the answer would be, well, that's not going to work, so why, why bother doing it? I, I, uh, that, that, that sounds like that might well be the case. Um, Bingham had a kind of sad second act or wh whatever after this, these extraordinary achievements uh, that you've described, being at the center of the major debates over civil rights and liberties of his era, he then went off to be ambassador to Japan and sort of missed the follow-up for uh, the Supreme Court's refusal to implement the 14th Amendment. T tell us about, about his last years. Well, he, he's not renominated for another term in Congress in 1872. Basically, he's been in Congress for 20 years at that point. People were tired of him in his district. And so then after he leaves Congress, President Grant appoints him to be ambassador to Japan. And he spends 12 years as ambassador. And by all accounts, had a wonderful time, enjoyed being ambassador, was there with his family. He came back and retired. And at this point, he was 70. And he lived to be 85. Uh, unfortunately, he just got old and also outlived his money. Uh, no pensions in those days, right? And so by his last years, he was having all sorts of health problems, dementia, basically. And also by 1900, when he died, the 14th Amendment was simply not doing what he had hoped it would do. Um, African Americans were not voting in the South. African Americans were not being given equal treatment or being guaranteed fundamental rights. And actually, when he died, um, the obituaries really didn't even mention the fact that he had written this portion of the 14th Amendment. They talked about some other things. Actually, if you go to his, the town where he's buried, and there's a statue to him, which is a nice statue, it has this ins inscription on it. doesn't say anything about the 14th Amendment. Uh, it does say that he was for tariffs that would protect industry, which you know, doesn't seem like a rousing <laughs> slogan it's for important, someone. <laughs> it's nice, but. Yeah. And um, so, so that, that, was, that was sad. And, Indeed, you could also say that because he was in Japan in the years immediately following uh, the Supreme Court's, or during the Supreme Court's initial interpretations of the 14th Amendment, that he, he was unable really to influence those interpretations at all by either arguing cases or just making speeches and so on. And we all might have suffered as a result of his absence. I saw, I, I, I see this great photo of the statue and I was struck it says photo by the authors. First of all, it's a very nice photo. Congratulations. Oh, <laughs> but it, this, uh, this suggests that they're not uh, did easily available photos of him because not a lot of people are paying attention to him. It's just so striking that you had to physically take the picture of the statue for this first definitive biography. Um, why is it that even, he, as you say, he was, when the statue went up, no one remembered that he wrote the 14th Amendment. Why has he been so ignored since then? Part of the problem is that during the period of Jim Crow segregation, the leaders of Reconstruction were viewed unfavorably. Uh, I like to tell the story that there's actually a movie, uh, a biography of Andrew Johnson that came out in the, eight, in the 1940s where he's the hero. And what a great guy because he wanted to bring America together and get past all this 
bad feeling from the Civil War, and Thaddeus Stevens was played by Lionel Barrymore. And uh, for those of you who remember Lionel Barrymore, and uh, it's and oh, okay, <laughs> That's great. and uh, and is d depicted as a villain. And so, really, until the Civil Rights Movement came along, people just would not take seriously the idea that that folks like Bingham were high-minded or were pursuing a cause that was just. Now, since then, uh, some of the discussion of Bingham has gotten caught up in the broader discussion of other legal issues like what do you think about applying the Bill of Rights to the states or what do you think about different things that he was for. And if you, you aren't really on board with some of the things he wanted to do, then you tend to attack him rather than the ideas. Uh, now, hopefully that's going to change. Uh, and. Uh, who knows? Maybe this book will help change that a little bit. Well, it certainly uh, should and will. And the obvious question now is, how do we get this to Steven Spielberg, and who plays Bingham in the movie? <laughs> Someone with long, such a long mutton, you know, mutton chop <laughs> sideburns would, would need to be the person. Uh, I, 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 I don't know who would. Uh, there, certainly, uh, you know, why not? Why not Tom Hanks? Tom, <laughs> Tom Hanks would be great. He can play anybody, right? So. And and of course, uh, Lewis would be great as well. Mm. Three, he would, he would do just as uh, good a job there. Uh, well, I think we have time for just one or two questions from the audience, if uh, uh, there are any. And my wonderful colleague Robin has the microphone, so please wait for it. And yes, yes, ma'am. What I'm wondering is, what would Bingham think of the government shutdown that's going on right now, and the whole really debate? That's going on between the Republicans and the Democrats, and just great, great question. Thank you so much for asking. Yes, thanks. Uh, well, I think one thing to say is Bingham was a very partisan person. He was a Republican. He didn't much like Democrats, uh, and the whole of Reconstruction was partisan. You know, there were very few Democratic votes for the Fourteenth Amendment at that time. Now, of course, it was, the parties were totally different then than they are now. I mean, Democrats were mostly from the South, and was, uh, they had this believed in different things than what would be the case now. Uh, and the, the fights that the book talks about between Congress and the President and inside of Congress were very, very bitter. This was a time when a senator was beaten senseless uh, on the floor of the Senate, and where people carried pistols into the Capitol and had them in the House chamber. So I think he, he will certainly would have been comfortable with the thought of very partisan, very intense fighting for what you thought was right. Uh, and beyond that, it's kind of hard to know what he would think about the specifics of health care or that sort of thing. That's great. Yes, sir. And then, and then uh, part of the uh, remarkable language in the 14th Amendment were two words, any person, any person. Doesn't mean citizen. Citizen comes up earlier. It includes children. It includes demented people. People who are not competent. Did, do you think that Bingham really understood what he was proposing when he said any person? Because children, old people, demented people, a whole variety of people don't get equal protection. Uh, and we incarcerate people without due process all the time. It's about a million old people were incarcerated without any due process. So I wonder what, 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 did, what do you think he had in mind when he said, when he wrote, any person? Well, one thing he had in mind was that he wanted to protect people who were not citizens. Immigrants, what we would now call lawful residents. And he was quite clear that they had rights, too. And he, he even said that they had the right to free speech, that that was a fundamental right that applied to all people, citizens or non-citizens. So the reason for that language was that he wanted to make sure that uh, recent immigrants were protected in their basic rights. Uh, and now, whether he, he thought about it you know, to the extent that you're talking about you know, and, and covered sort of all of those categories. I mean, I think in general he did, but whether he had stopped and sort of paused and thought about, well, what about children and what about uh, the elderly, I, I, that I don't know. But, but he, what he had in mind were making sure that non-citizens were protected 
in what he believed were their fundamental rights. Wonderful. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, I'm, um, I'm trying to make it fast. No, I, uh, for the, you know, the Gettysburg was uh, the 150th anniversary. So a movie came out July the 3rd about, uh, uh, you know, anniversary of Gettysburg. Peter Fonda was like the only like real big star in it. It was called Copperheads, right? I had never heard of it. Well, Copperheads were Caucasians, right? That um, they were opposed to slavery. I mean, they hated slavery. They, they thought it was a, 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 a moral evil. However, they was uh, anti-Abraham Lincoln because he took away habeas corpus. So they were saying that they felt as though that when you take away habeas corpus, even though they was uh, opposed to slavery, but they hated Abraham Lincoln on the sense that they, they were saying that uh, people that um, that didn't that could have been innocent was like uh, their human rights was being violated or taken away from them. So and then it's f and then they also had a guy now I forgot his name because like I said the only big star in it was Peter Fonda that I could recognize, but they had a dude in there was playing Andrew Johnson as well and he pa like you say one vote saved him. But the reason how that one vote saved him was his brother-in-law <clears throat> and they cut deals. Um, Andrew Johnson he was able to um, take his own personal wealth give it to his brother-in-law, and his brother-in-law was able to influence certain people. It was they call them, what they call them, backroom deals? Yeah. Oh, and the money, and that's how he passed by that one vote. But the movie's good, it's called Copperhead. <laughs> that's a great uh, recommendation. And what, what was, the, this is the last question, what was, what was Bingham's uh, relationship with, the, with Copperhead? Was how was Not friendly, <laughs> as, you, as you may imagine. Uh, he co basically called them traitors, and sort of uh, gave these very fiery speeches in Congress uh, attacking the most prominent of the Copperheads, who was also from Ohio, uh, and uh, yeah, didn't didn't have uh, didn't have much sympathy for uh, for those who were sort of anti-war, you might say, uh, during the Civil War. Gerard, our goal at the National Constitution Center is for everyone to read the Constitution and educate yourself about it. Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot imagine a better way of educating yourself about the Fourteenth Amendment than reading this spectacular book. Please join me in thanking Gerard. <laughs>